All right, everyone, welcome to a very exciting episode of Outside the Studio. This is Tessa, as usual. I am still your host and always will be, I hope. I shouldn't say always, but planning on it for the long haul, being your host of this amazing podcast, Outside the Studio. I'm so excited and honored to have a repeat guest on our show today. This is a very special conversation with Dawn Aurora Hunt. You may remember her as the Kitchen Witch. She is a two-time author now. We're going to talk a little bit about her second book. She's a two-time author. The first book is A Kitchen Witch's Guide to Love and Romance. And the second book that she had come out this year is Kitchen Witchcraft for Beginners. Um, and so this is a fun episode because we don't just talk about the book she's written, although they are very interesting, salient, poignant, um, and applicable to our daily lives. Even if you're not into witchery, you might find something helpful from this episode. I'm also going to link uh, the original episode that she and I recorded in the show notes. So if you're interested in that, be sure to check it out. But I did pop in here for a very special reason, a fun announcement. We're giving away Dawn's new coffee. She she went, so you probably know I'm from Portland, Oregon, well, adjacent. I I live in Vancouver, Washington, but if you're listening from afar, you might know the region of Portland, Oregon as being one of the two capital hubs of amazing artisanal coffee um, of the United States. And so we have this amazing coffee here and Dawn on one of her trips on one of her travels came to Portland and did like a walking tour of all the amazing coffee shops that we have. She took that experience back to her kitchen and created her own line of coffee, which is just coming out. And we decided to do a giveaway of her coffee. And I'm so excited to be able to offer this to you. All you have to do to win or to enter to win is hit us up on Instagram. You can DM me, Tessa Marie Tovar on Instagram and tell me what is your favorite morning ritual? Um, if you have one or your favorite morning practice, whatever it is, and Don and I will decide very objectively (laughs) who wins this amazing kitchen witch crafted coffee. One more quick announcement, and then we'll get right to our show. I just wanted to remind you all that I am leading my very first 200 hour teacher training beginning this January. I'm co-leading it with the amazing Christina Coco Hackenjose. We're hosting it at her home studio, Imagine Yoga Studio in Lake Oswego, Oregon. It's not too late to sign up to that. So if you're interested in it, I have a few informational FAQs on my YouTube channel. You can find that just by searching my name on YouTube, Tessa Tovar. Uh, You could also head to my website, which is where I have the application, which Again, my website is tessatovar.com. It's under events. So yeah, please hit me up with questions and enjoy the show. I know people comment on your episode quite frequently. Really? Yeah. How much they love you and, you know, the recipes in the book and... You're good for my soul, Tessa. You're good for my soul. I appreciate that. Likewise. I mean, I love... Oh, well, first of all, I just re-listened as I was preparing for this conversation today. I re-listened to our original podcast and it was fun. It was really fun to kind of think back to because that feels like what was that? Forever. Like forever. I don't I don't even know what day it is today. Like <laughs> I don't well, know what day it is. I don't even know what time if I said what day it is, this episode isn't gonna air for a few months. So it would be I don't know. Yeah. Right. Like, I think it's Friday today, but I it thought is. yesterday all day was Friday. <laughs> so yeah. I, 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 I have no sense of time and space because I is that because on... you're living through construction right now or what's going I on? I mean, it's, I think it's pace, right? I think when mm. people like us who are go-getters and are on the go and are constantly moving and doing and, uh, you know, scheduling out time and time and time, I tend to lose track of what day it is, where I'm supposed to be and when I'm supposed to be there. And, you know, you just got back from traveling, right? Um, Mm -hmm. At the time of this recording, you just got back from traveling. When this airs, you'll have probably gone on another adventure by that time. But like, (laughs) 
Yeah. I travel so much for work that I'll leave on a Thursday and I'll come back on a Tuesday and then I have to leave again on a Friday. And I, so I'm coming off of that right now. Yeah. Coming off of that and coming home to construction. Oh, so, okay. I have a couple of questions about this. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Firstly, are you traveling for the new book? Are you doing a book tour? Is it, <laughs> what is it that has you traveling so much? I wish I was doing a book tour. Um, no, I'm not doing a book tour. Um, so we met, you and I met because mm-hmm. of my first book, which was the uh, Kitchen Witch's Guide for Recipes for Love and Romance. Yes. The new book out is the Beginner's Guide to Kitchen Witchcraft. Um, but my regular job is that I'm a kitchen witch and I have a company based on kitchen witchcraft and spiritual cooking. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have a line of gourmet products. And so throughout the summer and the fall months, while the weather is still good, I travel around to events and sell my wares and sell my books and uh, and make appearances and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I just got off of a nine week event in New York Whoa. and came home to <laughs> like, I wasn't there for the full nine weeks. It was a lot of back and forth. So I'm up here in New Hampshire and I go there to set up and then I go there for Labor Day. And then if I have to make any drops for product, um, or if, if our team needs help, if someone gets sick and, and we need to fill in a, a, a slot on the sales floor, then I go. Um, and then I go for closing weekend, which is the breakdown weekend where, not that I break down, but I do sometimes, but like break down the booth <laughs> is what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> break down the booth mm-hmm. um, and, and kind of clean everything up and bring back all the stocks. So that was like a week ago. <laughs> And I came home. My day off was the first day they started construction on my house. Okay, so, so I'm that, a little like, oh yeah. my god. Well, and what then happened? that's my second question: What is going on? Why? What are you doing at your house? Do you mind? Sharing? So we're putting this <laughs> huge. We're putting a huge patio in the back. Nice. Um. So we have like almost an acre of property in our in our beautiful backyard. Um. Mm. But it's not really accessible to enjoy with friends and family because it was just like a big backyard with no door to get out there, no space to Uh gather. So we put a deck on uh, in the springtime and now we're putting um, a patio going kind of like around the deck. And I don't know what I was thinking. I think I thought, oh, they're just going to come and like put some stones down. No, they have like these construction vehicles. They're like ripping up the land, moving the dirt, bringing in uh, gravel, bringing in huge pallets of paving stones, like literally dig. They have to remove all of my plants Uh, and put them in other places. And I'm like, I don't, I can't see it. I just don't, just don't tell me about it. Like, tell me when it's going to happen in case I see it. So I'm not like devastated that my plants are uprooted. Mm-hmm. but the other than that, like, just do what you have to do. And I'm just going to walk around with you know blinders on. So I don't see, cause it's going to be awful before it's awesome. Yeah. And every, every week for the, every day for the last week, I've woken up to the sound of like the Bobcat machines back. Beep, 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 beep. beep. So that's oh. just, listen again, we don't stop moving. Yeah. Right. We don't. Stop, and it's wonderful. I wouldn't trade it for the world. But that's what's going on today. And that's why I was like, oh, shit, I got it. Microphones and <laughs> equipment and put makeup on. And <laughs> but tell me about your trip. Oh, oh, my God. Well, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Despite of course. All of the things that are going on in your life. And um, thank you for asking about my trip. I went of to course. Spain with my husband. Um and that's the second time we've gone to Europe together. And yes. it was, this is actually the first time we've traveled just him and I for leisure, not having it tacked onto work. Cause yes. usually if he has to travel for work, I'll kind of come along and then it's yes. kind of work and play, which is so fun. I love doing that. But this was like pure pleasure and leisure. And I have never been to Spain before. It's such a, have you been to Spain? No. Oh my gosh. It's such an, it's such a different culture. I'm not sure what I expected. I I felt like, oh, maybe it'll be a, I don't know why I thought this This is such a weird bias I have in my head. I'm realizing as I'm saying this out loud, I thought maybe because Jorge is from Mexico and he has Spanish ancestry that I would be familiar with 
part parts of the culture, but mm-hmm. it was unlike anything I'd ever experienced. Yeah. The food in particular was so, 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 mm. so different than I don't even know what I was expecting, but it was amazing. Don, you would love it. It was so, so everything was just so fresh. Everything is so affordable. Um, the eating times, you know, like the traditional Spanish siesta. Right, don't you eat at like of, two in the afternoon, like yeah. a big meal, like two in the yes. afternoon and then you just go take a nap. Right. I mean, you kind of have to, gonna, <laughs> but the one that. thing that I couldn't really, I tried, I tried to get on uh board on schedule with the late, late dinners that are, happen around nine or 10 PM, but I couldn't, I couldn't do that. So our hack was to go to the amazing markets. They have these amazing fresh food markets all over the country. So any city we were in, we'd find like some markets and we would get some salads, some Spanish ham, which is like the, um, I think it's called Iberica. Uh, it's like that really cured expensive ham, which is so worth it. It's so good. Um, and like the cheeses and oh, everything's just so fresh. The wine. Oh my God. If you like wine, like anywhere yes. in Europe, pretty, yes. pretty affordable. The Spanish wine, just divine. And people are just so nice. So we we went to Madrid. We went to uh, Toledo, which is this medieval town that's on a hilltop. And it's kind of almost preserved like it was built back in, I, I want to say like 1500 something. I can't remember exactly, but that was really cool. It's just tons and tons of amazing architecture. Then we took the train up to Valencia, which was beautiful. It's a coastal town. It's where paella originated. Mm-hmm. Oh, that was oh, fantastic. Oh, my God. Right? Ah. Right? Oh. 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 And then we took the train up to Barcelona, um, which is th- that part of Spain where they do speak Catalan and where you see a lot of w- Catalonian signs and words. So. We could kind of get, since Hori's a fluent Spanish speaker, you could kind of see like, oh, I could see what that might mean um, right. in Catalan, but it's it's very different than Spanish. So um, the the architecture in Barcelona, because Gaudi has such a h- huge influence all over the city, you see like parks and houses and all of this kind of whimsical, psychedelic architecture, these huge, massive pieces of art that are buildings that wow <laughs> he built back in like the early 1900s so I was like gosh what was what was going through this guy's brain very interesting wow. very cool <laughs> yeah. why did you choose Spain mm-hmm. and why did you choose Spain now so like, what was your what was the impetus for this trip I was just kind of along for the ride my husband um had a sabbatical uh, so this was, it was like a five week sabbatical and he's like, I want to go somewhere big. Um, and like I said, it'd been a while since we traveled together. Yeah. Um, and so we knew we wanted to go to Europe and Jorge's uh, dad's side is from Spain and he'd never been there before either. We have been Italy. His mom's side is from Italy. So it was kind of like coming full circle, visiting family land, I guess I would say. I wish we would have done a little bit more research in terms of what part of Spain his family is from. Um, All I know that is that they were fleeing. They came to Mexico because they were fleeing. um, Was it Francisco, the dictator? I I don't know. In the 1940s? I don't don't know, but that that would make sense. I mean, most of those places in, you know, around World War II, Mm-hmm. There were hard, like that's you know they have that big influx but into uh, immigration in America you yeah. know right before World War One right after World War One one right around the beginning of World War Two I mean because shit was going downhill and everybody's like like my Italian yeah. relatives were like we got to get out we yeah. you know we got to go uh, but what Tessa it's a trip of a lifetime yeah it was it was magical <laughs> was it transformative was there anything that you saw or ate or learned that changed your perception of that country or our country oh i love this question yes and i would say that the the thing is the not only the the way um, that food is prepared and it's fresh. There's a lot less preservatives. You look at two products that are the same product, they're the same brand, 
you turn it over, look at the nutrition facts. There's a lot less ingredients in that same product in Spain. They mm -hmm. don't use as many preservatives. It's not allowed in, mm -hmm. in, a, in most parts of Europe. That's and then correct. the second thing um, is the style of eating is so the pace. It's like so leisurely. You could sit down anywhere, white tablecloth, Michelin star restaurant, and just have a cup of coffee and sit there for two hours with your journal and nobody would bother you or try to turn the table or try to get you to move on your way. And I think this is because this is my assumption. I could be wrong, but it seems like that the, I guess what I would call working class or the wait staff are paid a living wage. So they're mm. not trying to turn the table over to make ends meet because they survive on tips. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, a pace of life that is so much more like I felt like I was truly able to sit and enjoy my meal. And it took us probably like two hours to eat lunch every day. Mm. <laughs> and then yes. so like contrast that with coming back home. We went out to breakfast the first Saturday we were back and we went we went to one of the places close by our house. It was, they had just opened this restaurant in the States and the restaurant was not even half full and they were clearly stressed out that I had just walked out of the restaurant to go check on the dog and come back. And the lady was like, well, where's your third person? I can't see your party unless you're all here. Like she was stressed out that we weren't all coming in the door at the same time. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> like chill. Over What's again. happening? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think too that there is. I, I think that that European culture, in terms of food, how food is prepared, how food is enjoyed, and I, I think that is a direct correlation to the pace of life. And you know, here it is commonplace to grab a granola bar as you're running out the door because you have to sit in traffic for four hours to get where you're going or drop your kids off at school or your boss is going to be pissed that you're late. So you're going to hit a drive through or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you only get, you know, a half hour for your lunch. So you've got to pack something with you, you know, to make sure that it's, you know, airtight and because you don't have a refrigerator and then you, you have to, you know, scarf your lunch because you've got to get back to work and then you're going to rush home and your kid has 17, uh, um, you know, activities to do after school, or you have to do this, that, you know, run the stuff to the dry cleaner, do this, you know, all these errands you have to do. And you get home at seven o'clock and you have to throw something on the table and then you have to do it all over again the next day. Mm -hmm. The way that we purchase food, the way that we consume food, the way that we farm food in America is very different than the way they do these things in Europe. Mm -hmm. In Europe, you get up in the morning and you might go to town for a cup of coffee, a cup of cappuccino, have a pastry, have a conversation with the person that's making this for you, mm -hmm. meet a friend, sit for a minute, and then you're going to walk to work. You're not driving. You're not going four towns over, you know, you're, you're going to walk to work and then you go to work and then you have this meal in the middle of the day. And it's perfectly acceptable and totally customary to spend an hour or two hours enjoying a larger meal. Mm -hmm. It's perfectly acceptable to purchase on your way home from work at this fresh market, what you're going to eat for dinner. So I'm going to buy, you know, one fresh tomato for the salad I'm going to make for dinner. I'm going to buy one piece of chicken. I'm going to buy whatever it is. And I'm going to eat that tonight. I'm going to go home. I'm going to fresh prepare it. I'm going to eat it. And, and then the next day I'll buy the next meal that I'm going to eat tomorrow. Here we budget. I don't know about you. I, I do this. I have two hours and I'm going to go to the grocery store. And in those, that's the only window of time that I have that I can go in the next two weeks. So I have to do everything. So all my food has to be packaged. All my food has to last for those two weeks. Mm -hmm. And, and that way of thinking really affects the way that we consume food, share food and prepare food mm -hmm. in this country. And it's like you said, you don't realize it until you're away. And then you're like, Holy crap, I need a minute. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Oh, I love that. That's such a beautiful, um, it's not a metaphor, but it's just like you wrapped it all up in this, in this very articulate way of what I was trying to explain. And so, yeah. And I think I, I that's think so it's... true to what you write about in, oh, thank you. in the, in the kitchen, Witch's guide. And I haven't actually gotten my hands on the new book yet, but the beginner's guide. Yes. Can you tell me, can we, and I don't want to cut you off, but I do want to dive into what inspired you to write the second book. Maybe it's been on your mind for a while. Maybe, um, there was a, a big demand from your audience. Um, yeah, don't let me cut you it's, off though. It's an interesting, it's an interesting story. Um, and, and, and do cut me off because now I have my own podcast and I'm not used to being the guest. I know you're used to being me. The, I love it. I'm you're very used to being the host. So totally <laughs> cut me off. I don't know how to do this anymore. Um, so it's an interesting question how this, the beginners, uh, kitchen witchcraft for beginners is the name of the book. And this is how bad I am. I don't even have a coffee. It's in my kitchen. I, it's like, I don't have a copy of it sitting here with me that I could show you, but it's yeah, where it's you called... use it. Right. Right. It's exactly. <laughs> um, it's, it's kitchen witchcraft for beginners. And, um, it's funny because this is a class that I've been teaching for a decade, right? Mm-hmm. I started out my career teaching the basics of kitchen witchcraft. Um, mm-hmm. and I would just, you know, go around and teach a class and be like, this is kitchen witchery 101, right? Uh, eat locally, eat seasonally, um, you know, put intention in and here are your top 10 things you should have in your kitchen if you want to start this. And then here are some seasonal recipes. And I used to teach this class. And about a year ago, um, a publishing house approached me and said, we want to write this book and we hear you're the person to do it. And I was like, okay, I mean, I can't, you can't, you don't say no to that. You're like, uh, yeah. Cause then you think if I don't write this book, they're going to get someone else to do it and it's not going to be right. So I got to do it. Um, and I was like, yeah, I can do this. Cause this is what I've been teaching for so many years. This is just, so this is just the way that I live. So it was a very natural project for me because it has, it, it's just my way of life. And, um, when I meet new people who aren't, who aren't witches, who aren't kitchen witches, who don't understand what, what I do. Um, this is the basics. And then when you explain it to people, they go, Oh, that doesn't seem like witchcraft. It seems like common sense. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> yes, like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a hundred percent true. And, and it sort of turns that light bulb on for people. So it was a really fun project to work on. And I did get to do things with this book that I hadn't done before. So even though for me, the topic is something that I've been teaching for so long, what we included in the book besides just uh, food recipes where was I got to challenge myself a little bit and create some recipes that were like, okay, if we want to put together a natural cleaning kitchen, cleaning fluid, Mm -hmm. right? Let's that's also kitchen witchcraft. Um, again, that mindfulness and working with fresh ingredients and working with natural elements, um, and, and things like tea making and simple, um, charms or spells that you can do to, for protection for your home or, you know, creating a space of intention with within the kitchen. We don't really get too much into that in the the recipes for love and romance book, because that book is really focused on how to use aphrodisiac foods, loving yourself and all that jazz. This book is more like a manual for if I want to employ, employ these basic techniques, where do I start? Mm. So I feel like I got it wrong and I should have written this one first and the other one second. It's like the prequel, yeah, you know. Yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. I love that you said that. I don't think that's getting it wrong, though. I mean, so many so many authors do prequels because they're like, "Oh yeah, there's a step before this." Okay, yeah. let's do that. I love yeah. that. Beautiful. Well, um, and so what's I was curious, uh, because a publishing house approached you for this one. Did you approach your writing process any differently, or did you Ooh. already have that kind of template from the first book that you just? slipped back into totally different, mm-hmm. totally different. Um, and I am going to be, you know, this is like all the stuff, like your PR person is be like, don't tell people this stuff, but I'm going to be honest. I'm just going to be honest and authentic. Um, the truth is, um, this book had a really tight deadline. 
um, it needed to be done very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And that was another reason why I took the project because I thought I could do this fast. Mm -hmm. You know, I already know all this stuff. Um, however, sometimes I bite off a little bit more than I can chew. <laughs> I am a consummate overachiever because sleep is for wussies. That's a joke. I don't actually believe that. Um, <laughs> and I, I took this project in the middle of doing a deal with QVC for my gourmet foods. And I was like, yeah, shh, I can, I can do this. It's totally fine. So, um, I was doing these two huge things at the same time. My writing process was not at all the same as the first book. Um, with the first book, I, it, you know, the first book was happening, you know, the recipes for love and romance that was happening. I wrote that book primarily was written right before the pandemic started. Mm -hmm. So I think my, my manuscript first draft date was like March 15th, 2020 for that book. So I had all the time in the world. I was very, my, my editor was very like, you have as much time as you want and let's do this and let's do that. And then the world ended and the, you know, and then the, the photos became a, oh, well, let's just get it when we can get it. And again, it was like, just do whatever you can do, you know, cause everybody's going through the shared trauma. The new book was like, the world is open, get it done. You know, and again, at the same time, doing this other huge project and and working with QVC and and um, manufacturing infused olive oil for months and months and unboxing it and on all that. So, I found myself, you know, spending twelve hours a day, fourteen hours a day, working at my warehouse making oil and and making boxes, and that would be like all day Monday, and then I would come home and all day Tuesday, I would spend 12 or 14 hours a day um, writing, just mm -hmm. sitting and, and writing and, and going through my old notes and making sure that I'm hitting all the points I wanted to hit um, and, and juggling these two very, very huge projects at the same time, which if I'm being entirely frank and honest, it was a terrible idea. I'm very proud of myself and I got through it. But for my mental health and my emotional health and my physical health, I pushed myself and yeah, I showed myself what I could do, but it was very challenging. And I would not do that again because part of the learning process of being a creative person or being an entrepreneur is to learn balance mm -hmm. and realize that without that balance, you won't be able to continue to function at the level you need to function to be a badass. If you want to be a badass, you have to take care of yourself as hard as you work. And I'm the first person to say that. And I did not do it. Yeah. And I wound up actually hurting myself um, and wound up being out of commission. I had um, a really rough bout of vertigo um, from a pinched nerve in my neck from repetitive motion injury mm -hmm. from both this, these long days of doing nothing but writing or doing nothing but, um, working in the warehouse. And so the universe was like, girl, you're always preaching self-care. You didn't do it. We're going to make you do it. And you're going to be stuck on the couch for the next three weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it was very challenging and I feel like because I was doing so much at the same time, I'm not the type of person that um slacks right so if i'm if i'm doing two huge things at the same time i'm still giving them the same amount of attention that i would have given them if i was doing them separately mm. so they're giving a hundred percent to the book and a hundred percent to the qvc project and that's really <laughs> that's hard on a body and a mind um and so i didn't absorb everything that i was doing emotionally mm. And when I got through the book, I was like, whoa, I don't even remember doing it because it happened so fast, yeah. you know? And I was like, wow, this is actually, this is actually pretty good. <laughs> 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 
but it's, it's all stuff, you know, I mean, that must have yeah. you, it seems to me like you were able to produce that in such a manner because it's so it's, it's something that's inside of it, you, and you just had to put it down on a page. I mean, you said yourself, you'd been teaching this class for decades. Yes. I guess my question is if you could go back and do it again, knowing what you know now, would you do anything differently? Having these two amazing opportunities. I mean, how would you say no to a QVC product um, project and also right. a, a book deal being handed to you basically yeah, at the same time? Yeah. What would yeah. you do anything differently? Oh, I, again, probably shouldn't say gonna say, uh, <laughs> I probably would have told QVC the timing wasn't right. Mm. Um, because it pulled my resources where I could have been spending them elsewhere, or I would have staggered them differently. And I think for anybody listening to this and you think, wow, that's like you said, the two amazing opportunities at the same time, I think as an entrepreneur, as a writer, as a creative person, the most, imp- there, there's a handful of things I would say are the most important things. Um, you know, and one of them is learn that not every opportunity that comes to you is the right one. Mm, or that's... it's the right timing for that one. Right. Mm. Um, because l- listen, you, you win or you learn, right. You never lose, you mm. win or you learn. And what I learned through this experience was yes, the information in, in the book and the book is wonderful. And I'm, I'm very, very proud of it. And I'm lucky because what I was able to write about is just the way I live and and it's very ingrained in me, right? Had it been any other subject, I feel the work would have suffered Mm -hmm. because I was doing something else that was also huge at the same time. Fear is a fucker. And I don't know if I could say that on your show, Tessa. Yes, you can. (laughs) Fear is a fucker. And fear of missing out is a double fucker. Mm. And to have these two opportunities in front of me, I felt like I have to say yes to both of them. I can't, you can't look the universe in the face and say, no, thanks for this, but no, nah, I don't want that one. You know, you, and the truth is I could have had both opportunities and enjoyed them more had I s- separated them out a little bit further. Mm -hmm. done one than the other. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's my own personal journey. I'm saying being able to say no, and it's hard to say no when you are afraid that that won't come back around. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's just that. I mean, I'm sure this is not the conversation you thought we were going to have. Um, but that's what I love talking about because it always kind of goes, wherever it needs to go. And people who are listening to this are the ones that need to hear it, right? If they're right. hearing that, then then they're the ones that need to hear it. But you're bringing up a really salient point that has become so apparent to me lately. And one of my good friends just challenged me to to do this thing for two months. Speaking of fear, that scares the fuck out of me. <laughs> like you were right. saying, fear is a fucker. Um, so we were pulling, I got this beautiful tarot deck the other day. I'll show it to you. Mm-hmm. Yes, please. So, it's called the sacred web and I love uh-huh. the art in it. It's just, yeah. I mean, every tarot deck's got such really cool art, but we did a reading for me. It was a six card spread. And the theme that kept coming up is that the fear is the thing that's personally holding me back. I mean, you talk about fear of missing out, you know, like opportunities coming your way and you feel like, how can I possibly say no to this? And the challenge for me is to do the thing like saying no or saying this isn't the right time for me and noticing that I need to say no. Here's the here's the thing that the thing that I'm trying to articulate. The fear is what's telling you when to say no. Does that make sense? Mm. So because in my body, I'm always like, well, I have to say yes to that. That's an incredible opportunity. Or I have to let go of this thing, which is no longer serving me. It's making me sick. But I'm mm-hmm. scared if I let go of it that I will have missed out on some what what I think it is, you know, as an entrepreneur, my next big break. Mm-hmm. But the fear is the thing that's telling me that I need to 
take that jump, make that leap Mm -hmm. and believe that I'll learn how to fly or I'll land on my feet. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that, that fear, when you know, you're afraid of something, it's a sign to, to act. Yes. Right. So if you know you're having a fear of something and you know you're afraid of missing out or you know you're like oh crap you know when i get afraid i get like i feel it in my stomach and i like i can't breathe and i'm like what if what if what if right um that is a sign of like if you're so afraid of losing out on this opportunity why yeah. mm-hmm. why are you so afraid what is the thing you're afraid of and is that real mm. right is that real? Because most of the time our fear is BS yeah, and, and it's not real and it's not ours. Right. So if you say no to something like QVC, what could possibly happen? Well, you might lose the opportunity forever. Okay. You might not make money. Okay. But then you also have to trust the universe that if this, you're not even the universe, your own path, right? that if this opportunity you let pass, there's another thing that's waiting for you that's bigger. And if you say yes to everything, you're going to be missing the things that maybe are sitting right in front of you. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So I think I like the way you put it. Like the fear is the thing that's telling you to say no. Mm -hmm. Right. Because my question is always, well, how do I know what the right choice is? And it's this kind of adulthood pattern of ignoring my intuition. Mm. My body is speaking to me so loudly in the form of fear, anxiety, stress, neck ache. Like the intuition (laughs) is talking to me from my physical body and I'm not listening. So the challenges from this reading was when I feel that fear, that's the thing that I lean into and say, okay, I'm fearful of this. Then that either means I need to let it go or say no, because I have the tendency to say yes to all of the things, right? Just like what you're describing. And it's, it's to a disservice to my mental health, my physical health, and probably my growth in the end, right? I think it's important when it comes to fear that we pay attention to it and that we listen to it and that we really dig through it because sometimes your fear is pointing you in the right direction. Like if you're terrified that you're not good enough to do the thing, that's your fear saying lies to you. It's like bullshitting you. And it's like, you know, oh, I'm not good enough for this. Or, oh, I'm, you know, for me, it's a lot of body image stuff. Like who's going to want to, you know, watch a fat girl cook on TV. Do you know what I mean? And I'm like, everybody, you don't trust the skinny cook. I'm just saying. So like sometimes your, your fear will sit in those places of your mind that give you doubt. Right. And sometimes it's pointing you in the direction of, well, screw you fear. You don't know what you're talking about. I am going to take this opportunity because I'm, you're not going to, you're not going to convince me that I can't do it. Right. That's why it's so important that we listen to that fear and, and understand, am I afraid of missing out on an opportunity that's not right for me? And like you said, Tessa, listening to intuition and saying, I feel in my gut that this is not right for me, but I'm afraid I'm going to miss out. So I'm going to do it anyway. Versus am I afraid I can't do it? And why, mm-hmm. you know, and then those are the spaces we lean into and go, screw you fear. I am going to take this opportunity. So learning to walk within both sides of that, I think that comes from being honest with ourselves, Mm -hmm. what we really want. And that's the harder part, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the honest with yourself. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. (laughs) This is like my life's work and lesson is to really be honest with myself. I can't even tell you the amount of times somebody asks me a question and I'm like, and it's something that that pertains to me. Okay. For example, what is your life purpose or what is your soul purpose? I'm doing this, um, 30 day shamanic questions with a group of friends right now. And it's all about soul. You know, what is your soul really saying to you and that reconnection to intuition and remembering the bigger picture. 
And oh, kitty, here she is. This is a <gasps> beta. <laughs> oh, she's beautiful. Thank you. She's I didn't mean starlet. to. I didn't mean to derail you. Look at her. She's gorgeous. Thank you. If we're gonna, if we're gonna show our cats to each other, pause one second. Okay. Wait, wait. Here, here, here. Ollivander. Hi, Ollivander. Now he's your star because you have Sirius Black Cat too, right? But Ollivander made a, a showing on our first interview. Yeah, because he's a ham. <laughs> and that's how this one is. They look like they could be yeah. related. Yeah. <laughs> His face. Uh, uh. He's so he's a sleep, he's so sleepy, sleeps in my window when I'm in my office here. Uh -huh. And he's just like mama what's yeah. happening okay i'm gonna put you look at her though she's so smushy he won't sit for too long and be held this one only wants to be held if i'm doing something on my computer or if i'm recording a yoga class yeah and then she's <laughs> like mama yes. pay attention to me yes exactly no, he, he won't let me hold that was like the most i've ever held him like he's not he wants to sit on you or sit near you but he doesn't like to be up you know he doesn't yeah. like to be up on you. Anyway, your shamanic <laughs> journey and being honest with yourself. What is like, what is the thing that, that you find hardest to not be honest about? Like, well, it's like, I've developed this pattern of saying, well, I don't know. My intuition is so quiet. And just like I explained before, um, and I say that with all this sarcasm in the world, right? Because <laughs> obviously I do know because my body's telling me um, your neck hurts, your back hurts. You keep injuring yourself. You, you're not listening to your body. Your body is talking to you all the time. Right. And what is that, but a manifestation of a deeper wisdom of your intuition. Mm -hmm. And so that when I say, when my knee jerk reaction is to say, I don't know what I want. I don't know what my soul's purpose is to me. And this is kind of a judgmental way to say it, but to me, I, I'm copping out because I'm not doing mm. the work of what you were describing of analyzing the fear of taking the time to pause and slow down and be like, wait a minute, what's that really about? Why can't you look at yourself and be truthful? Why is it so hard to answer that question? What are you so scared? Of? Yeah. What are you so scared? What, but you are, we are all scared of things. We're mm. all scared of, you know, not knowing or missing out or messing up. Or for me, it's disappointing people. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm really, mm. I'm really always afraid of disappointing people. And, and it goes like specifically, I'm, I'm afraid of disappointing the people that are on my team that are always believing in me mm. because I'm like, you believe in me. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. You know, I, who's driving this bus, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm in charge and I, I'm like, why? I don't know. Um, and I'm, I'm disappointed. I, I'm, I'm afraid of disappointing people that like who, you know, read my books and, and mm -hmm. buy my product. And because everything I do, it's like, here's this thing I made, please love me. You know, like, you're constantly looking for validation. Once you understand the thing that is actually frightening you, you can look it in the face and be like, well, what is it I really do want? Mm -hmm. Who do I really want to be? And then let that inform your decisions. I think too, that indecision and saying, I don't know is so much easier than committing to something and possibly not having the outcome that you want. Oh my gosh. So if you, yes. If you continue to say, I don't know, I'm still working on figuring it out. You'll never actually take a leap. You'll never actually take a risk or make a mistake, mm -hmm. which is a really safe place to be, but it's very frustrating because yeah. you feel like maybe you're not progressing, right? You feel like you're not making a choice, but I don't know what choice I should make. Remind yourself, nothing is fucking permanent. Mm -hmm. You can always change your mind. You can always pivot. You can always stand back and go, like I just did. I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that way. I should have done it this way. And now I know for next time. Well, like and that's the result of you there is no lose. You win or you learn. And I love that, what you said, because it's so true. It, there's always a lesson. If you see it as a failure, 
then that's how it's going to feel in your body maybe, but is that really true? And could you take a step and say, well, what did I learn from that? What am I going to do better next time? What am I going to do differently? Exactly. And I think that's something that, you know, again, I am a writer. I am an entrepreneur. I am a partner. I am a friend. I am all of these things. If I never take a risk in any of those areas of my life, I won't grow. I won't progress. I won't be a better writer. I won't be a better entrepreneur. I won't be a better partner. I have to, and that's just for me. I have to continue to push myself, but have to be honest about what I want, how I want those things to go, and also understand nothing is permanent. And I am in control. You are in control of whatever you do next. So if it doesn't work out or you change your mind, you have the freedom to do those things. You have the freedom to pivot within your own life and your own decisions as an entrepreneur, as a writer, as a creative person, as a yoga teacher. You can always change your mind. I think we're taught you got to do one or the other and that's it. And when you live life, you realize it's not it. Like that's crap. Yeah. That's yeah. so. That's such an absolute. Uh, what's the, I don't think this is a word. Absolutism. <laughs> it's, it's like, right. Black or white, right or wrong. But that's really not the way of the world. There's so much gray. There's so much nuance. There's so much we need to. It's really hard to live in that um, kind of shifting sand, you know, scenario. It's not even really a scenario, but it, it is challenging when when we want things to be crystal clear and often mm-hmm. they're not. They're never. Tell me one situation in your life you felt was like crystal clear. Like at, for me, the only thing in my life that's, well, that that's not entirely true. Like <laughs> meeting, meeting my partner. I was like, there was a certainty. I was like, oh yeah, he's the guy. Mm-hmm. And starting my company, very crystalline. Like, oh yeah, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. And that goes back to that intuition, right? Yeah. There are things we know, like, you know, about a person when you walk into a room, mm-hmm. you know, like, have you ever been for a job interview? And like, you knew the minute you walked through those doors, I got this job before a word came out of your mouth, you knew it, or you knew I did not get this job. Like immediately, immediately. that's that intuition, right? So why do we listen to it so hard when we know something's right, but we don't listen to it when we know something's wrong? Oh, I love that question. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if I have the answer to that. Maybe it is the fear. Maybe it is the fear of failure, the fear of whatever it is missing out. I want to, um, so gosh, time, I know we talked about a I want more time. <laughs> There's a couple you, of things I wanted to ask you, um, yeah. but I also want to be mindful of your day and I, I do want to let you go fairly soon. Um, we have so I many did, technical difficulties. You can take my time. It's okay. Well, okay. Let I'll, I'll try to keep this short. Yes. So there's a couple of things that I've been face. We, I, I Instagram stalk you and I Instagram I, stalk you too. I was totally oh, following your adventures in Spain. I, I was it. like, Oh my God, Tess is having the best time. I'm so jealous. I was but I like was in the best possible way. Yeah. Oh, of course. And so what I've been noticing lately is there's a lot of, you, you talked about your products and stuff, but um, the witch's brew is something that seems new on the scene to me. It's, it's like a, yeah, about the witch's brew. Yeah. 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 So, um, so yeah, but then the last couple of months we've put out a lot of new things. So the, obviously the kitchen witchcraft for beginners, that's brand new. Um, it was released on September 27th. So at the time of this recording, that book's not even a month old. So that's still new and fresh and, and really wonderful. Um, and then kind of at the same time, we have come out with a line of coffee. So everything we do at my company, which is Kachina Aurora, every Kachina Aurora Kitchen Witchery, everything is done with intention. Everything is done for um, mindfulness. Everything is, you know, infused with love and, and positive energy. In fact, um, we have our own manufacturing space. Um Nine times out of 10, every product that comes through my warehouse has been touched by me. They're mm-hmm. all my own recipes. Like we don't send things out to be manufactured elsewhere, right? Mm-hmm. So you'll love this because you're in the Pacific Northwest, right? Yep. <laughs> okay. I so I went to the I went to the Pacific Northwest a couple of years ago on vacation to Portland, Oregon, which is yes. It's like my it's 
it's literally one of my favorite places on earth now. Um, mm -hmm. We went in 2019 and I completely fell in love with the city. I completely fell in love with the people. Like my life goal is to have a space out there, just a little apartment or a condo where I can write. So I could come out there for a couple of months, do you a writing come project. Stay at my house. I, I, a hundred, I a hundred percent would. And okay. I have a bunch of friends now in Portland. Like, I don't know how I attracted all these Portland people. Um, and also like, you need to come here and we need to go to Salem mass. I'm just saying, yes. uh, come on. That was on the docket. I know, I know it was And Rosie right. both want to come out. I have a guest room. You could stay here. Okay. Um, so we go to Portland, Oregon, and we take this coffee tour, walking coffee tour of downtown Portland. It was like a whole day. And all we did is go from all these different places and try different coffees and learn about coffee and how it's brewed and how it specifically a third wave coffee, which it refers to the third wave of European influence in the coffee industry in America. This is the third wave of European influence in America. And I was like, shit, no one on the East coast is doing that. Mm -hmm. We need to do this. Lo and behold, I went to a summit for whole foods, um, because my products are in whole foods here on the East coast. And I met a guy who does third wave roasting. What right. does it mean to be third? Is it like the year, the vintage or it has style? to, it has to do. Yes. It has to do with the influence. So, you know, it, the first wave of influence, the, the second wave of influence, and this is the third wave of insulin of, of influence in how the beans are roasted. Um, it's a little longer, lower and slower than your traditional American style roast. And now we're seeing the influx of things again in the Pacific Northwest, you see this kind of stuff all the time, the pour overs and, you know, the Chemex and all that stuff. We don't see that as often as frequently here on the East coast. Now we are starting to, but even five years ago, we didn't really. So I found this guy who's got a local roastery, uh, ha a couple miles from my house, um, who does this style roasting. So I worked with him, um, to create these beans, um, and so we started, so I get the beans from him. He roasts them in small, tiny batches. And then I grind them. The seasonal brews are ground with er different spices. So um, at the time of recording, this is October. And so right now we have an autumn brew, autumn witches brew. Like we said before, seasonality is really important in my kitchen witchcraft. So the, the witches brew autumn is ground with cinnamon chips and that's like bark chips nutmeg and ginger and i mix it all together and so you brew the whole thing with the herb, the spices right in there as opposed to having flavorings or spray or syrups or mm -hmm. additives mm -hmm. so it just brews with all of that and then the winter will have um our winter brew is it's, it's divine it's um you it's brewed with cocoa nibs peppermint and um pepper uh, pink peppercorn oh my god so again, i want to do a giveaway I it's, want to do a giveaway. It's so good. And then I've just come out with, ha ha, spoilers. No, this isn't even out in the world yet. I just put these on my website yesterday. They are phases of the moon coffee. <gasps> so we ha yeah. No. So they're designed specifically and they're roasted specifically with the flavor notes that um, are parallel to the phase of the moon. So the full moon roast is light and bright and energetic and it's citrusy and illuminating like the full moon. So this is a brew that you would make it's whole beans. So you can grind it yourself and you can make it at any time, but specifically during the full moon, you can use this as your full moon ritual and make this cup with intention because every witch I know makes tea for medicinal purposes, but every witch I know drinks coffee every single day. Right. <laughs> so why do we not have this? I don't know. Um, so then we have a half moon uh, coffee and then we have a dark moon coffee as well. So that's, that's brandy spanking new. Um, and by the time you guys hear this recording, it will be available on our website. Okay. And so I do want to do anyone who reaches out to me, uh, via Instagram, DM me at Tessa Marie Tovar. I want to hear what your favorite morning coffee ritual is. And I think Don, you and I should probably decide what answer we like best because I want to give away three bags of yes, uh, the moon coffee. Yes. Full moon, moon whole moon. Yeah. Full moon, half moon, dark moon. You get a set. 
you get a, a now it is whole beans. So you got to have a, okay. got to have a ground, got to have a okay. grinder. Well, is that a good question? Would you ask a different question? No, I love that question. Okay. Like what's your, what's your favorite morning ritual? I love that. And yeah. And does it involve coffee? And yes. thank you. you know, it doesn't have to, but like, what is your favorite morning ritual? It's so important how we start our days. And especially if you're trying to employ kitchen witchcraft, how you start your day in the morning, cup of coffee, cup of tea, bowl of cereal. Do you drink water? Like, what are you doing in the kitchen first thing in the morning to start your day with intention? Yes. Oh, that's a beautiful place to wrap up. And I just want to remind you again, we will be giving away here at Outside the Studio in conjunction with Dawn. This is. I, I will buy it and send it to you. If you DM me at Tessa Marie Tovar, um, what is your favorite morning ritual and does it involve coffee? And hopefully you like coffee if you're answering this question, because that is what you're going to get. <laughs> you're going to you're gonna, you're gonna love it. You're going to, yeah. like I said, I haven't even really like officially pushed the product yet. We did this big event. Like I was telling you at the beginning, we were out in New York at this huge event that lasted a bunch of weeks and we introduced the product there. Um, and I couldn't keep it in stock. I mean, it was crazy. So I was trying to launch it on the website at the same time. And I was like, I don't have enough stock to put it on the website and sell it in person. So by the time this airs, we'll have plenty of stock. And if you don't win the contest, you can just go to the website. And yeah. And the website is, is it still Kachina Aurora? Yes. Kachina okay. And then our olive oils are there risottos the cookbook is there both of my cookbooks are there and if you buy them through the website they come signed yeah yeah by me yay oh i love this don you are a blessing thank you so much for your time thank you well everyone that concludes another amazing episode of outside the studio i hope you enjoyed yourself i hope you learned something new maybe remembered something old, maybe felt inspired to apply something to your life. My, (laughs) you can hear my dog in the background. She's doing a little happy dance. Um, So Daisy enjoyed it. Anyhow, I wanted to just pop in here to wrap us up to say a couple of things. Number one, I have such an amazing team that helps me put these podcasts together. Without them, I wouldn't you know, be able to bring these amazing conversations to you. So thank you to my producer, my director of creative services, my sound editor, my um, engineer, Consistency Media. Don't know what I would do without you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the amazing creation and artistic, musical, genius, Drew Lovern, thank you so much for putting together this music for specifically for outside the studio. So unique to the show, only place you're ever going to hear it is right here. Thanks, you guys. You make my world go round. Stay well, everyone. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Share on the socials, especially if it's a show that you think, hey, this could help somebody else. That's what this is all about, right? We're sharing information so that we're better, um, so that we're inspired, so that we're lifting each other up and we're learning how to be in this world, living on this planet to the best of our ability, sharing information and inspiring one another. And that's my hope. That's my hope for the show. Take care.